Good evening, everybody. If you are watching this in uh, live time, it is 7 p.m. Eastern time here. We are thrilled to have you joining us this evening for the Vermont Pitch Challenge Entrepreneurial Exchange. My name is Brooke Willett. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior admissions counselor at the University of Vermont and thrilled to be here with Marco from the UVM ARC program. Marco, I'll let you uh, explain all of the acronyms and everything since I always butcher the name and I trust you to do it a lot more. Just wanted to hop on and thank you all for being here. I know that for some of us in the Northeast, it's a pretty uh, snowy, windy evening. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your day whenever you're watching this to engage with us. Throughout this webinar, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A feature. Please feel free to put those questions in there and I will make sure that Marco gets them so that we can answer all of those questions for you. Just a reminder for some things coming up, the application, the long awaited application for the Vermont Pitch Challenge opens this month in just a couple days. So next Monday, the 15th, that application will open. You are welcome to submit your applications in teams of one, two, or three. All of our rubrics and submission guides and rules and all of that can be found on our website. If you just Google UVM Vermont Pitch Challenge, easiest way to find it, I find. Make sure you're signing up for the interest form if you haven't already. Uh, sign up for the remaining webinars. We have two more coming up, so we're really excited about those. You can watch all of the recordings from the past ones and really take a look at everything that we have to offer through this challenge. So that you have it on your radar, I know that spring is really busy for our high school students. Uh, the in-person final event, and reminder, that's for our five finalist teams, that is going to be hosted on April 4th. It's a Thursday, uh, so we just want you to kind of be aware of that timeline. We will be letting finalists know in late February. All of our teams will receive some feedback as well, so you'll be able to see all of the feedback regardless um, and the outcome and all of that, we're excited to see what you have. And I think that Marco will be able to share a lot of really wonderful tips and tricks for you to use for your upcoming application and eventually the live pitch uh, as he goes and talks about really creating a compelling pitch and really marketing yourself in, in that way. So you've heard enough from me, you hear from me every time. So Marco, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, and take it away. Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, I just wanted to start with a brief intro. Um, so my name is Marco Caliandro. I'm a senior here at the University of Vermont, and I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, how to create a successful pitch. Um, so a little bit of background. I joined UVM as a transfer student, actually, um, in the first semester of my sophomore, uh, of, excuse me, of my junior year. And it was there that I joined as a team member. And um, the program itself takes undergraduate students and it pairs them with technologies and professors who have invented those technologies and gives that student an opportunity to actually step into the role of commercializing it um, and helping bring an invention to market. So basically we're paid interns who find a market and get real world entrepreneurial experience um, uh, working out of UVM as well as um, various co-working spaces in the Burlington area, such as the Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies and Hula Lakeside. So um, definitely check out ARC. The acronym is ARC or the Academic Research Commercialization Program. Um, if that is something you're interested in and you uh, um, want to get started with something like that during your time in college. So without further ado, I'm going to get started with my presentation. Um, so how to create a compelling and successful pitch. Now, what is a pitch? A pitch is really something that you're going to use in various capacities. Uh, in this presentation, I want to go over a pitch deck, which is um, a way of presenting to investors. That's not the only context where a pitch may be useful, um, but it's the one I'm most familiar with. And it's something I've gotten a lot of experience with uh, thus far in the ARC program. So please feel free to reach out with any questions during this I would be happy to stop and take it, or we can save it for the end with a Q&A. So without further ado, my favorite part of um, commercialization and what I think is most important in a pitch is customer discovery. So what is customer discovery? So customer discovery is finding the reason your product should exist within the market. And it sounds really simple, but who has the problem? How are they currently solving it? 
And how is your solution either cheaper, better, faster, or all three? Um, that's really what it comes down to. A lot of times, um, inventors and entrepreneurs focus extremely heavily on their technology, and that's great, or whatever it is, if it's a technology, if it's a piece of clothing, um, but they don't actually know who their customers are, uh, what their behavior looks like, and if they would buy this thing. Um, now, obviously, you may be at a place where you're not even close to thinking about um, your customer, but you should be. Uh, this is really the backbone of what makes a great pitch is knowing your customer because that helps you better understand the problem. So I'm going to show you a pitch deck I made uh, with a few of my team members last semester. I thought it really gave some important, um, I, I thought it was just a great pitch overall, and I would like to highlight some aspects of it that I think would be helpful for you all to know. Um, so this was Recover AI. This was a product I worked on, a little bit of a quick background. It was a knee sleeve that could estimate how much loading was going onto your knee. Um, so this was something that wasn't currently offered in the market. And um, this was our problem opportunity. So uh, this is knowing the problem. And this should be a simple way to make the audience or whoever you're speaking to immediately have an emotional reaction. So you want those people to uh, really have um, a, a personal connection. So for example, if you were solving uh, male loneliness, right? That's something that's on the rise. It leads to a lot of chronic issues personally and within society. If that was something that you wanted to solve. You would need to make people really feel why that's a problem. So let's say we're using that as an example. You would want to have statistics about health and life outcome disparities and, uh, you know, what does prolonged isolation cause? You know, what is that harm? So for this specific product, we focused on prolonged injury of anyone, athletes, just people with knees, vague data. Um, so current methods of tracking were really not working and then unpredictable payments. So there was a lot of issues on the medical side and with insurance. And this was our problem opportunity, right? We had a technology that could measure knee data. That's what we had. Um, and then this is the problem that we thought we could solve with that technology. And we validated what we thought we could solve through customer discovery. And what you want to have after your problem opportunity and making the audience feel like this is really something that has not been properly addressed, you want to make it clear how you are going to fill that hole, that market need, and fix that problem. So for our example, it was effective recovery, the right data, and decreasing financial risk, but that could really go for any product, right? Let's say you were making, I don't know, for example, uh, a new method of taste your blueberry pancakes, right? Seems a little bit silly, but your problem would be that current blueberry pancakes don't have your secret ingredient and therefore can't provide the best possible customer or consumer experience. Your value proposition is really where you talk about how your blueberries taste, right? Why is it different? What are you doing that is solving that problem that nobody else is doing? So you want to go from your value proposition straight into your problem your, excuse me, your problem opportunity straight into your value proposition because that's going to allow you to really hone in and make people at the start of your presentation feel like you have what it takes to solve this chronic or societal issue. The next thing is you really want to dive into your underlying mat, uh, magic. So if it's a product, these are the features. And this is what no one else does. So in this example, we focused on muscle loading, range of motion, joint loading. That's what we had to offer. And we had this knee sleeve with these specific algorithms. That's what we had. Um, it wasn't necessarily the prettiest picture, but it's what we had at the time. And this is something that's going to evolve and change over time. Something about making pitch decks, pitching, is it just takes practice repeated practice, repeated iterations. It's not always going to look pretty, um, but this is really where you want to show what you bring to the table. So it's important to note you're not starting with your product. You're starting with the problem. Then you start with how you're going to solve the problem. Then you move on to what you're actually offering. So you have a title slide, problem opportunity, value proposition. Now you're getting to your product. A lot of people think you need to start with your product, but that's actually not compelling. 
People don't want your product unless they understand why they need it. The next thing you need is a viable business model. So a business model is how you're gonna make money and it doesn't need to be exactly what you'll end up doing, but do some market research, figure out where the dollars are coming from and how they're gonna come back to you. How are you gonna capture that value? So in this example, we had someone send uh, a customer, uh, they would send um, their specific knee sleeve, um, excuse me, uh, a, a patient would have uh, money coming into uh, their pockets um, initially from, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting another call here. Um, a patient has a problem, right? So they're sending knee, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna slow myself down here. I'm running into a problem right now. Um, I'm a little nervous. Confidence is one of my key points. Um, but the business model. So in this example, you have a PT practice and over here on the right, you have a patient, right? And then in the middle is your PT practice on the left, you have your subscription. That's us. Those dollars you see moving back here, um, that is our company. So we identify that the PT practice is our middleman. That's how dollars are going to move. Most people don't have enough money to actually spend on physical therapy products. Um, so a business model is really where you are going to have multiple streams of revenue that's attractive to investors. We weren't just buying sleeves. We were using reimbursement from CPT codes, and we were also um, having upfront sales of the sleeve itself. So if you can have more than one stream of revenue, that's really attractive to investors, but you're really showing how money is made. I, <laughs> I didn't do a great job of describing this slide. So um, definitely let me know if you have questions about a business model. The general idea overall is you're mapping out where the dollars are coming from and where they're going. Now we're gonna move into market sizing. Market sizing is something that can seem a bit intimidating if you don't have a financial background, um, but that's completely fine. Something that you can start out with, it's really, really easy, is your TAM and your SAM. Your TAM is your total addressable market. So for this, we were looking into the sports market and we looked up fitness trackers uh, within the professional sports market. We found actually through doing that, that we didn't need to be as specific as fitness trackers, right? We could just look up sports market global. And we found that that was a $90 billion market. That is your total addressable market. Those are all the dollars that can be captured from the market you want to enter. Now, obviously you're not going to make all those $90 billion. So you need to move into your SAM. Your SAM is your serviceable addressable market. And these are actually going to be guesses. There's no way you can possibly know how much money you're going to make but you need to make an educated guess. So we took our total addressable market and we took um, roughly 1% of that, uh, one to 2%. It was not a lot, but we thought we could reasonably capture that. Now, sometimes you'll also do a SOM, which is a serviceable obtainable market, and you'll make an even smaller number, but that's really not necessary for most pitch decks. Um, if anyone has any questions about TAM or SAM, let me know. But this is a really standard, uh, this is an industry standard. Now, some things that are helpful to include are also customer findings if you have done any customer discovery. Um, but really, your market sizing is the majority of what should be on the slide. Your market comparison is where you're going to show competitive advantage. So for our company, Recover AI, we chose four metrics that we thought we could really perform on. So we chose joint loading metrics, remote patient monitoring, portability, and range of motion, right? Those are four things that we thought we had nailed down that the industry didn't. We then did market research. Market research is just getting on a computer, finding other companies doing what you're doing and seeing what they can bring to the table. So it's really not that complicated. I was doing a knee sleeve, so I searched for other knee or joint monitoring uh, companies, but you can do this for any venture. Let's say you're doing ketchup, right? You're, you're going into the condiment market. You're gonna look up all the other condiments and you're gonna see 
uh, you know, what's their flavor profile? Do they have um, you know, are they sweet? Are they salty? Are they sour? It may seem a little bit silly, but this is where you're really going to show how you stand out from the competition. And it's great to make a graph like this and to keep a running list of other companies because your market comparison is also a list of your competitors. These are the people who are going to make it hard for you to compete. Um, and they're also people who may end up being partners. Uh, partway through this journey with this specific venture, we ended up pivoting away from trying to become our own company and entering into a potential licensing deal. So we actually ended up um, entering into a potential deal with Miontech, who we identified as a competitor from day one. Um, so your competitors and your partners may end up being the same people. So that's why it's really important to know them like the back of your hand. Um, now we're going to move into financial projections. And this one can seem really the most off-putting to anyone that doesn't have a financial background, right? You don't have a product, you don't have a, uh, you know, you're not in the market and you've never done this before. How are you supposed to know how much money you're going to make? The truth is you don't, it's going to be a guess, but the more educated you can make your guess and the more you can back up that educated guess, the more you can actually show evidence of where you're at least getting these numbers is actually going to really, really increase your investors' perception of your technology. Now, for this pitch conference, it's not investors, right? It's uh, it's judges, but still, these are great skills to know, and having financial projections can actually make you stand out from others who might not have them. So the way we calculated these is a little bit complicated. Uh, what we did was we basically searched up basic prices for textiles, and that was it, right? We took those prices, we took those costs, and then we estimated what our, um, what our price would be for the product. And we gave ourselves a reasonable amount of growth. And we looked at what our increase in profit would be um, if we were to reach scale. So scale is another big thing. Um, the way your product is gonna become cheaper and more affordable is by increasing your number of customers. So in your financial projections, you can use what you have from your market sizing. You can take those numbers and say, okay, um, we're gonna reach 1% of our total addressable market and here's how we're gonna get there. And you can lay out year by year exactly how you're gonna get those dollars to accumulate. So financial projections um, really, really seem complicated, but when you break it down, if you look at expenses, you've got wages, right? That's something you can calculate. How much are we going to pay the CEO? This isn't, um, you know, an up and running company, so we just need a CEO. Let's say it's sixty thousand dollars a year. That's fine. Um, if we're going to have R and D, how much is that going to cost? Well, you can look at similar products. Learn how did their product um, get developed? What were their costs like? A lot of times, you can end up just calling a company and saying, "Hey." Can I speak to someone there who's knowledgeable about the history of the company? Do you know about this company? Do you know who I could speak to? And that brings us back to customer discovery, right? Customer discovery is really the bread and butter of a pitch because customers are the business. So if you can, get to know your customers as soon as possible. Your team slide, this was the team we had working. We had a team of researchers, and then we had a team of commercialization specialists. So it really doesn't have to be too complicated. Who are you? What do you do? And that's it. You can talk about your background a little bit. That can sometimes help. Um, but really, we just want to have those faces and those titles. And then your thank you slide. So it's important to have contact information at the end of your pitch deck so that um, investors or judges or anyone viewing your pitch can reach out to you. Um, I want to go over a few important do's and don'ts. So some do's that I would say is just practice making a 10 minute pitch. Even if you don't understand 90% of what I just said to you, um, go online, look up how to make a 10 minute pitch, put in each slide and just go through it in your bedroom, to your parents, to your brother, your sister, it doesn't matter. Just practice doing a 10 minute pitch and start selling. A lot of times the practice is actually gonna get you to figure out what it is you need to sell your product or to sell your idea. Um, one thing that you definitely should not do is wait till you have a finished product to get to know your customers. As soon as you know what you wanna do, start reaching out to people. The worst thing that can happen is they hang up on you. 
So let's say you have an app that is going to um, increase efficiency of transit somehow, right? Maybe it's a ride sharing app. Um, call Uber, right? See who you can talk to there, even if it sounds really intimidating and you can't get a hold of the CEO. Call the customer service line, call an info line, send an email, start talking to the people doing what you want to do now, even if what you're doing is slightly different. Um, also, just remember that your customers care most about how your product fixes their problem. This is something I've had to work on extensively and it's really hard to break out of this habit, but you need to remember that generally people buy things because it alleviates a problem in their life. Even if it's a good thing, usually, it iterates and it's better than something else that was worse. So it can be kind of a negative approach, but for this example we used back with our pitch, right? We had our problem opportunity. Human suffering and loss of money is extremely simple and it's really easy to get behind that. Prolonged injury, vague data tra tracking, and unpredictable payments that are bad for the consumer and for the patient. You really need to hone in on what the problem is and how you can fix it. Something that you absolutely should do as well is seek the help of those with more experience. As you can tell, I'm young, I'm still figuring out. You heard me fumble a little bit earlier in this presentation and um, that's the name of the game. You're gonna make mistakes and you're going to need to figure out how you can improve from those that have already done it and have already been through it. So this can be uh, resources at your school um, resources at UVM, you know, even if you're not a student, there are a number of professors, especially if you are really professional and really kind in your outreach, who would be willing to talk with any student who's interested in entrepreneurship. And those are things you can research online. If you just search up UVM entrepreneurship professor, worst thing that could happen is they don't respond. And then remember that no matter how far along you are, just practice, just practice getting up and running through your pitch, running through what you're going to say. Um, this is extremely, extremely important, and um, it's something you, you really, really can't do enough. Um, one thing I do want to do one more time, I do want to go back a little bit. Um, I just fumbled so poorly, uh, <laughs> so badly when I was talking about business model. Um, I was just feeling a wave of nervousness. But um, an example that I did want to give was um, ours. So we had a sleeve, and we had a customer, but we didn't really know how they were gonna purchase it um, and if they would spend the money. And we figured that actually our product was too expensive for the average person. Most people are not gonna spend $200 on a sleeve to help with their upkeep of their knee and their recovery if they're already struggling with cash like so many people are. So we had the PT Practice Act as a middleman. We identified that um, insurance payments are another source of revenue that we could tap into. Right. So we have the patient here on the right experiencing chronic pain. And we said, we're going to send them that knee sleeve. And that knee sleeve is coming from the PT practice. So the PT practice is our customer. They are the ones buying, not the patient. Right. So we are marketing to the PT practice. So we sell our sleeves to the PT practice. The PT practice gives the sleeves to the patient. And then the patient gives their money back to the PT practice, whether they pay out of pocket or they have insurance. Right. So we came in and we added another uh, payment option, which actually increased our revenue streams. So now we are actually getting money from the PT practice. And we're also getting money directly if we sell this product online. And that's something that you really, really, really need to figure out is who's buying this and who's paying for it. And if you're worried about people being able to pay for it, think about how someone else could pay for it for them. Um, so yeah, I did uh, run through this pretty, pretty quickly, but um, I really wanna open this up as much as I can for questions, for Q and A. Um, I really am best on the spot and I wanna see if anyone has any questions or things that they are struggling with um, when creating a pitch. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions in the chat for you, Marco. I'll kind of start and read them off. Uh, the first one says, did you start this process by thinking about the solution first or the problem? Yeah, absolutely a great question. So I'm kind of in a unique situation with the ARC program where we're paired with technologies and then we're tasked to find a market for that. 
So I actually have to start with the solution and then find the problem, which is a little bit difficult. Um, if you already have a product in mind, I don't really recommend that you then go and find a problem. I think it is going to be easier if you're someone in that situation to stick with the, pro uh, the product you have. That being said, if you have an idea and you're not fully sure of it, um, you can always pivot. So let's say you do have an idea, but you're not sure there's a market for it. First thing you can do is you can research if there's uh, similar products. Second thing you can do is you can just do customer discovery. You can just start reaching out to people and seeing if there is a need for it. But to answer your question, do you think about the solution first or the problem? I would say in general, start out by thinking about the problem. Um, nine times out of 10, that is what is gonna make people uh, purchase. Uh, purchase. <laughs> that, that's, that's what makes people buy. Um, so yeah, Madeline, I don't know if you're able to share a little bit more about um, what it is, you know, your situation specifically, um, but yeah, def definitely think about both. Um, but the problem is most important. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I, I would love to know a little more, but uh, no worries. Um, are the business models created like a flow chart? Um, business models created like a flow chart. I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that question. Um, are you able to provide a little more clarity? So I'll, I'll do my best to answer. So it, there, there's not one way of presenting a business model. So uh, we have this way of sort of visualizing our business model. Uh, I don't think it's perfect. Um, oh, sorry. Is this an example of business model you provided or is similar to other business models? Yes. Yeah, so this is an example of a business model, um, but you can visualize your business model however you want. So if you have multiple streams of revenue, it can be helpful to use arrows. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you, you can really visualize your business model however you want. The main two things you want to make clear are where is the money going and where is the product going? Who is the money going to and who is the product going to? And who, most importantly, is paying for all of it? And where are those dollars among, along that process, right? Is the buyer immediately connected to the consumer or is there a middleman like the PT practice in this example? Awesome. Thanks so much, Marco. We do have another question from McKenna. Uh, McKenna asks, I have my problem and product idea. What should my first step be? Okay. You, you, you have your product and you have your idea. What should your first step be? Um, are you able to share a little bit about what type of product it is? Is it a product or is it a service? Uh, and are they able to hop on the mic? It looks like McKenna says product. Okay, awesome. Um, um, okay, yeah, so uh, could you say it again? You have a product, you have an idea. Yeah, so it looks like uh, McKenna has a product and the idea uh, and problem. What should their first step be? Awesome. Okay, so I would say your first step should be to reach out to folks who have that problem or who you think have that problem. So um, take that problem, start thinking about who's experiencing this. It's probably more than one person, right? Is it, um, let's stick with the example I was using of knee sleeves since we're on that topic, right? Is it soccer players? What type of soccer players is it? Is it women's soccer players? Is it men's soccer players? Who has more injuries on average? I would absolutely start out with reaching out to those folks and recording what happens in those conversations. So ask for permission, say, is it okay if I record this interview? Um, and just ask for a quick 15 minute inter, um, informational interview, because after you do that, you're gonna have evidence to back up um, your product and your solution. Um, after you have a little bit of um, clarity from customer discovery, and customer discovery is not the only method if you're intimidated by it, you can also just go online and start looking at um, people who have this problem, what are the other ways that they're solving this problem? Um, and after that, I would say to start with building a pitch deck. Um, I know on the website for this conference, they listed, you know, 
how to build a 10 slide pitch deck. That'll tell you much better than I can. Um, but I would just go through the process of building a pitch deck because for this competition, you're uh, presenting to win the prize, right? You don't have to like meet some kind of sales quota. So I would get started on your pitch deck and get started pitching. And with any questions that come up along the way, just ask. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll give it a couple, a little bit longer. Uh, if there are any other questions, anything you would like to know, uh, kind of while I chat at you a little more, uh, we can keep that open in case you have anything else for Marco. Uh, I know that sometimes questions come up later. I know that sometimes we think of things as soon as we get off the webinars. So if anything comes up, uh, you are welcome to email us. You're welcome to give the admissions office a call, whatever's gonna be easiest. And I can make sure to connect with Marco to get any questions answered from the presentation. Uh, Oh, I'll pause because it looks like we have another question for you, Marco. Um, it says, I have a problem and a service idea to offer, but lack the knowledge in that field. Do you know what I can do while I get the knowledge? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, like it, it's it's absolutely so fine to um, to not know at anything. Um, the nature of entrepreneurship is that we are learning as we go. Um, so it's totally normal to not have knowledge in that field. And while you get the knowledge, um, I would just work on creating your value proposition, right? So maybe you're not entirely sure of what your problem opportunity is, but just start guessing, guess about that problem opportunity. What do you know? Um, the nature of all of this is it's going to be educated guesses and you learn incrementally more and you refine those guesses. So it's okay. It's not really lying because you're not selling anything yet to anyone to just make a guess and present it as a statement. So um, you, you, you don't know a lot about that field, um, but you do know what the problem is. So guess about what you don't know about that field. Um, and while you're making those guesses and while you're building your pitch deck, reach out to folks who might have the answer so that you can fill in on the stuff that you missed or the stuff that you uh, miswrote or misstated, but don't wait until you know everything to act like you know everything, right? Like just start using what you do know and um, building a pitch, building a pitch deck based on those assumptions and that knowledge and, um, and, and just work on getting it. Honestly, that would, that would be my main piece of advice is um, guess until you get it. Um, one other thing is I am pretty busy, but please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, here's my email. I can't promise that I'll be able to answer everything immediately on time, but this is something I'm really passionate about and I'm happy to help out. I'm, you know, obviously still learning myself and I just want to grow this entrepreneurial community. And I think it's really great that everybody here has made a decision to uh, make a difference and to step into a role that's really intimidating. This is a big task everyone is taking on. Um, since my service is a course and I need information and a team develop the course. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so it, it seems like the thing you need is a development team. Um, so, you know, that's, that's not something you can exactly buy off of Amazon. Um, but it, you know, to seriously answer your, your, your question with that information, um, that's okay. You can get money to do development. If you really hone in on what your idea is and what you think the problem is, an investor may tell you, you know what, I want to fund this idea. I'm going to give you uh, money so that you can actually do research and hire a research team, right? Like don't let anything stop you. Um, since your service is a course and you need information, um, get that information. But uh, it seems like you have a key assumption or something that you know you could provide even though you don't have all the information. Stick with that, build on it and guess a little bit as you go and fill in those cracks if you can. Yeah, what great advice, Marco. Thank you for sharing all of this. I think another thing that's really great for you all, uh, and I hope that you will kind of keep this in the back of your mind is that 
we recognize that you all are still in high school. We recognize that you are incredibly busy. Um, I also recognize, you know, that it's a really incredible time for you all. You have the gift of having uh, what feels like absolutely no time and also so much time. I talk to my students all the time when we're working through the admissions process for college about you know, this is really the opportunity for you to kind of step into your own and really start saying, you know, what is it that I'm looking for? And what is it that I really want to contribute and kind of share with the world? And sometimes that idea is going to be flushed out. Sometimes you come into college knowing exactly what you want to study and you stick with it. Sometimes you know, you know, exactly where you want to go. And then that's where you graduate from. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you come in undecided. Sometimes you transfer. Sometimes you realize, wow, I had no idea that I loved this or I had no idea that I knew so much about this. And I think that that's what's really cool about the Vermont Pitch Challenge is you really have the opportunity to kind of get your feet wet in this world of entrepreneurship. You have incredible resources and mentors in Marco and the incredible students and speakers that we've had. So I don't want you all to get... Uh, nervous or scared that maybe you don't have the answers right off. You know, we're not expecting you to uh, send us any sort of final product or Amazon link or anything in the mail or email. Certainly you can if you have it, but you don't have to, right? This can be the very beginning stages. You know, UVM would love uh, to be kind of your starting point for reading about you in uh, Forbes one day or something like that. So some incredible magazines and things. We love to see what our students are up to and we love to help you where we can. Um, so don't let it intimidate you. This should be fun a little bit. It should maybe feel a little crazy and exciting, but um, I think ultimately this is gonna give you an opportunity to explore um, this idea of innovation and entrepreneurship in a really unique and exciting way. Um, yeah, are you allowed to know who the judges are? Yes, you absolutely are. We are so excited to announce that our judges are actually going to be current UVM students who are members of our entrepreneurship club, as well as the leadership team who have been working on the Vermont Pitch Challenge. So there's a kind of committee of folks who are doing this. We want you to be able to see and kind of mirror exactly what these pitch competitions look like when you get to us. So it was really important for us to have that student voice. So we have worked with uh, a large number of students to create the rubric, you can see exactly what you're going to be judged on and what the criteria are on the website. Uh, so you can see exactly what the rubric is, how many points you get for including your name and your hometown on your, your presentation. So you can see exactly what the benchmarks are. Uh, so you're going to see that and then you'll be able to meet them uh, if you're finalists as well when you come in person. So we're gonna keep the same judging cohort um, or try and keep the same based on schedules and everything like that throughout the whole thing to allow for consistency. But we wanted you to see exactly what the judges see. So you're, you have access to the rubric, it's a PDF. You're welcome to print it out and use that as your guidelines as well. Fantastic. Well, um, I don't want to keep you all, so I'll stay on for a couple uh, minute or so seconds if you would like, um, in case anything comes up. Thank you again, Marco, for doing this. This is incredible. I know you're wrapping up your winter break, so thank you. We're excited to have you back, back on campus uh, on Tuesday, which is great. Uh, You've got Marco's email in there. If you need to get a hold of us here at the Vermont Pitch Challenge, the email is V is in Vermont, T is in Vermont at uh, VT pitch rather at uvm.edu. You're also welcome to email me directly. It's brooke.willette at comcast.net uh, is the one that you can use to get in touch with me for things like this um, or brooke.willette at uvm.edu. Both of them sync to the same inbox. So feel free to reach out. We encourage you to do so. Um, thank you all for spending your evenings or whenever you're watching this with us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.